Hi, I'm Aaron Hoig, General Manager for High Pro Filtration. Been here for 28 years. Hello there, my name is Richard Trent and I'm a Regional Sales Manager for High Pro Filtration. I've been here since 2004. Prior to that, I had about an 18, 20 year career in the fluid power industry. Hi, my name is Scott Howard, High Pro Filtration, Strategic Account Manager. Been here 18 years. This is the High Pro Podcast and today we're going to talk about varnish. So, I'd like to talk about varnish and some of the reasons why varnish is created and the solutions to mitigate and control varnish. So Richard, if you'd like to start, what causes varnish? Varnish is nothing more than the oxidation byproducts that occur within the lubricant, saturating the fluid and eventually falling out of solution. Varnish, the root cause of varnish is oxidation. Oxidation is the number one cause of lubricant breakdown and to not get too deep in chemistry and, and, and make this too confusing, oxidation is simply the loss of an electron. So we now have this molecule that has a net positive charge. Okay, so when we have a, an oxidation event and we start to build up a contaminant, let's go to, through the process of what happens internally as far as the oil is concerned and then effective, eventually what happens within the system. So we're gonna have this oxidation that starts to get created and we have an oil that has a saturation uh, capacity, what happens next? So oxidation occurs, and when a lubricant is new or newer, it has the ability to maintain these oxidation events, events in solution. Now when oxidation occurs, there has been a slight chemical change to the, to the molecule itself. It's no longer the lubricant. It can form an acid, it can uh, form an alcohol or, or some other type of a byproduct. But at that point in time, it has also gained specific gravity. So that molecule is now slightly heavier than the lubricant itself. But early on, the lubricant is able to maintain that oxidation byproduct within solution. We call it in solution or in a dissolved state. That does not stop the varnish creation. So we still have oxidation byproduct that's being created. What happens when we do reach saturation of the oil? When the fluid becomes saturated with oxidation byproducts, the next oxidation event becomes or creates an insoluble molecule. And that insoluble molecule being heavy, having a positive charge, they're attracted to one another. Anything that's polar, they're attracted to that. But they're also attracted to metal surfaces and they will begin to plate out on those metal surfaces. And once enough of them plate out, we actually get to a point where we can see them and we then call it varnish. So varnish comes with different names um, as far as we call it an oxidation byproduct, but then when we can see it, we call it varnish. We have a dissolved oxidation byproduct or a, a soluble, as we like to use the term. We then would call it an insoluble uh, oxidation byproduct whenever it's above saturation. I like to use the term free floating as well. So where are some of the areas within a system that this oxidation byproduct that is polar would start to form? Uh, well, one thing to know about oxidation byproducts and lubricants is the lubricant's ability to hold these oxidation byproducts in solution is temperature dependent, much, with, much the same way with water. So the higher the lubricant temperature, the more these oxidation byproducts can be held in solution. So naturally, anywhere in the system where temperature can decrease, uh, say up in a cooler, in a reservoir, uh, you can have insolubles come out of solution. Uh, areas where there's low flow, you can have precipitation is the term of the molecules coming from in solution to insoluble. Uh, and anywhere there's low flow or low clearances is, is where precipitation actually occurs. You can also have precipitation if you have a machine that's in service and the oil temperature is warmer and then you come out of service if it's standing by. Things cool down, you can have precipitation that happens then as well. Correct. Absolutely. And then we have plating out the, uh, the oil. Temperature drops, as you were alluding to. The saturation point then drops. So now we're in an oversaturated condition. It starts to be expelled from the oil and it's polar, so it starts to build on itself. It doesn't cause any problems for valves at all, does it? Or does it? That's typically when valves experience their issue. 
is once the fluid is saturated and you have insolubles, valves, especially servos and proportional valves, have very, very small clearances. And in those low clearance areas with low flow, that's where varnish will come out of solution, plate out onto the spools or the body, and then you lose that clearance. So the spool loses its ability to slide freely within the body, and therefore you get stiction and the servo valve itself will eventually fail. And even before failure, you can see a reduction in servo valve response time. You know, if you're monitoring servo valve or valve response time, if it starts to slow down, that can be an early indicator that there's a problem coming. Speaking of early indicators, what are other early indicators? The valve movement and response time is very important uh, to point out. What other early indicators can we look to to see that we have a potential varnish problem? I mean, I think the, the progression of oil analysis, we've learned a lot from that. So early tests like uh, color metric, MPC, um, ruler, but in our experience with doing more comprehensive oil testing, we even see the formation of acids as a very early um, leading indicator that varnish is, could form soon. Um, also, a loss of demulsibility can uh, be a predictor. So we see that a lab report is important. So we take oil sample and we send it out to the lab so we can see the, the analysis. The acid level, is the acid forming or is it starting to increase? The MPC, so we're going to look at the color of the oil um, and indicators like that. Any other things that we would like to uh, look at on the lab report that might indicate a varnish uh, formation? Uh, the most common used is MPC testing. Uh, that's there is an ASTM specification for how to actually uh, perform an MPC test. Uh, ruler is another important. Uh, what does ruler stand for? Ruler ruler stands for the remaining useful life evaluation routine. So what are we focusing on with that test? In that test, you're comparing the remaining antioxidants as a percentage to 100% when the lubricant was new. So obviously, since most lubricants have antioxidants because the manufacturers of these lubricants know that oxidation is going to occur, uh, and as oxidation occurs, it occurs at a faster rate. Uh, oxidation leads to oxidation leads to even more oxidation. So antioxidants are added to these lubricants to arrest these oxidation byproducts or free radicals as they're called in, in, in some circles to keep them from causing additional harm to the lubricant itself. Uh, ruler is the, the, the most effective way with modern lubricants to measure the amount of remaining antioxidants. I, antioxidants are going to be consumed because of oxidation, so as the 100% new trends towards 0%, that's indicative that you have had oxidation occurring. So what I'm hearing is there's several data points that we need to look at. We need to be able to look at the acid number. We need to be able to look at the MPC value. And then we also need to look at the, the ruler test to see what the antioxidants are doing uh, within the system. Correct. Water would also be an indicator, but in some cases that may not be a part of the problem. But what we are uh, centering on is an oxidation event or a thermal event or both. So now we've talked about what causes oxidation byproduct and eventually varnish to occur, what kind of solutions uh, do we have to mitigate varnish and control it moving forward? Uh, there are several methods, uh, technologies on the market today. Uh, some of them deal with actually removing the oxidation byproduct for the, from the system. There's others that deal with trying to force those insolubles back into solution. Uh, one thing to note, and this is very important in, in the life of your lubricant, the greater the content of anti, or excuse me, the greater the content of oxidation byproducts within the fluid, the faster your antioxidant package will deplete. Since most lubricants are replaced as their antioxidant levels reach 25% or below remaining useful life, removing them out of the system can actually increase the lubricant's life as well as eliminate the, the possibility of varnish. Uh, the, Three most common technologies to remove it is electrostatic filtration. There's a couple of forms of that on the market. Uh, depth media, 
uh, and ion charge bonding resins, uh, and each one of those are applied to different fluids for different reasons, uh, and they remove varnish at different in, in different forms. So when you talk about the antioxidant or the uh, the additive package being depleted at a rapid rate, uh, there's a couple of those solutions that you talked about that may not slow down that depletion. Uh, depth media and electrostatic uh, contamination removal, and it has to do with the fact that the oil is still saturated. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, depth media and electrostatics, well, let's, let's talk about them in order, and we'll talk about them in the order in which, at least to my knowledge, they came into the market. Uh, the first technology was electrostatic filtration. Uh, electrostatic filtration can only affect an insoluble molecule. If the molecule is within solution of the lubricant itself, electrostatic filtration cannot touch it. That means that the fluid, at best, is always completely saturated using electrostatic filtration. Uh, we have an electrostatic filtration machine at HyPro. We call it an ECR. Uh, electrostatic contamination removal is, is what that three-letter acronym means. But as a rule, we do not apply that particular system to lubricants for varnish because we also have depth media. And depth media, being a, a second technology to remove oxidation byproducts, is a lot more efficient than electrostatic. Uh, depth media is real efficient in removing insolubles, but because of the chemical process of adsorption, it can also remove at least some, a small amount of, of soluble or dissolved oxidation byproducts. And then the final stage is ion charge bonding resin, that technology actually focuses on the oxidation byproducts that are in solution or those that are dissolved. And with that technology, we can run much lower MPC values than any other technology. Uh, but which technology we, reply, we apply is dependent on the lubricant itself that, that we're trying to mitigate. So the ICB technology, ion charge bonded technology, it's going to remove the dissolved oxidation byproduct out of the oil then we're going to use the oil to help clean the system. Correct. So the oil will then go back out through the system and will start to re-dissolve this insoluble oxidation byproduct. It's what I would say it's a slow process, but it's a thorough process. It's a complete process. It's not going to be an instant, but as soon as the ICB technology is employed, you're stopping the progression and then we're starting to reverse the effects. When it comes to a heat exchanger, that can be very important because we notice that a heat exchanger is an area, like you mentioned earlier, that varnish can form uh, internally, and then we know that that is an insulator. So then the heat exchanger is not as efficient. Right. And, and that's, kind of that's, on itself. that's an indication in a system that is in operation over time, uh, typically as it experiences varnish, if varnish is forming in the heat exchanger itself, you will see reservoir temperature increase over time as well. We've had customers that have tried to replace the heat exchanger thinking that that was the solution because they thought they had a faulty heat exchanger when in fact it was a varnish that was formation or forming on the inside. Right. Scott mentions an important concept that uh, varnish formation is uh, it's a chemical process. So when you talk about the ion charge bonding technology, it reverses that process, which is why it might be a little bit slow. So you're actually using uh, the fluid, once it regains its uh, solubility, to go out into the system, every parts of the system, and re-dissolve the deposits back into solution, and then bring them back to the resin, then for further removal of the soluble material. So. It's a process, and you're basically reversing the chemical process of varnish formation. So using that thought, what would you say to a customer that has an oil that is close to need, need to be replaced? Let's wait to replace that oil because we want to use the oil, oil to go do a lot of the job, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways to approach that, and one seems a little counterintuitive. So I've got oil that uh, doesn't have any more antioxidant additive. I've got varnish deposits. Um, so I'm going to change the oil, put new oil in, and I'm going to add some kind of uh, resin-based um, varnish mitigation technology. 
what happens in that case is as soon as they put the new oil in, it goes out, cleans the system, and then it could lose up to 30, 40% of its antioxidant additive right off the bat. So my recommendation to that customer is if they can continue to run without failure, put on varnish mitigation by ICB, ion charge bonding, and let it clean the system up. Let that oil that you're about to get rid of clean your system. Um, get rid of the varnish deposits so that when you put your new charge of oil in, it's going to maintain its antioxidant additive for a much longer time. It's something that we've seen um, over our experience with varnish technology is the ICB actually extends the life of the antioxidant package. I'm not exactly sure how it does that, but it seems to remove uh, the oxidation byproducts faster than they would be otherwise if they were um, consumed by the antioxidant additive package. We've seen that several times. We're maintaining low levels of oxidation byproducts within the system decreases oxidation rate, and by decreasing the oxidation rate, thereby you're increasing the life of your antioxidants because you're not having as many oxidation events, and those that are happening are being removed. Yep, exactly. So we may not be able to eliminate the reason why we have an oxidation event or a thermal event, but we do have solutions for mitigating and controlling the varnish formation to extend the oil life, to keep the heat exchanger operating properly, and very importantly, make sure that the valves operate correctly. Correct. And I, and I like the way, and, the, and, and I've heard several of you guys talk about this about water. You know, in varnish we, it's the same way. So there are many, many techniques to, to control varnish, and we do all of them. So we're going to put the right one or right combination of two or three mm -hmm. into practice when it's suitable. So, you know, for example, um, AW fluids, hard to use resin on those. So we'll use um, the VTN media there. Um, you know, and then you can talk about compressor lubes or, or turbine lube oil where, you know, those we use, uh, sometimes we use both. I mean, we've gone in with, um, you know, VTM media on the yeah. front end of those and then, or we use it in combination. Um, yeah, and you, you can make the point that all of the systems that we manufacture that use resin also incorporate VTM, or which is our depth media. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the resin-based system that we manufacture, as soon as it goes into service, it's removing both soluble and insoluble, the first droplets of fluid that pass through the machine. So immediately with that piece of equipment, we're focused on everything that is oxidation, and we're focused on getting it out of the fluid so that it's no longer there. And so you talk yeah. about, and then we talk about turbine oil as well. You know, it's a good chance to bring up NSD there because we talk about um, oxidation events. You know, in, in, in a um, high-speed gas turbine, you have uh, element sparking. So if you're using a non-spark element, then that it, you're eliminating one of the sources of varnish. It might not remove var varnish, but you know, why create? Or well, oxidation, if you can avoid that. So absolutely. In turbines, you can do that. The static discharge, any kind of a thermal event, uh, that in and of itself doesn't produce varnish. Remember, varnish is purely from oxidation. Now, heat uh, and contamination increase the rate of oxidation. Oxidation byproducts being present increases the rate of oxidation. So, if you if you're Think about the CDC. It's in the news a lot right now. But in, in the lubricant world, it stands for clean, dry, and cool. Clean and dry, that's contamination. That's the solid stuff and water. Both of those things increase oxidation rate. Keep it cool because heat increases oxidation rate. Those are the three things that you can do to, to try to manage oxidation. But oxidation is going to occur in your lubricant. And for the depth media, the VTL media that we refer to, we have two different ways that we use it. First of all, in kind of a pre-loading or the preconditioning of an oil that may have a lot of uh, insoluble or free-floating oxidation byproduct, before the ICB canister is employed or deployed, 
and then part of the process in conjunction with the uh, ion charge bonded canister to continue to help uh, polish the oil. So there's a multi-use function for that death media. ECRs, electrostatic contamination removal, where do you see it's most effective? I see it in EHC systems. What's your thoughts on that? Group 5 lubricants, synthetic, fire-resistant, hydraulic fluids, uh, phosphate esters. Uh, one of the problems that occur in those fluids as they go through thermal events is the byproduct is very, very small carbon particles, way, way below one micron in size. And electrostatic filtration is by far the best technology, and that's where it does exceed depth media. Uh, in removing those particles that can make an EHC phosphate ester fluid appear to be as dark as a cup of coffee. What typically causes that is uh, small fines or small carbon particles and electrostatic filtration is great in removing those and it can turn a black fluid back into a uh, amber type fluid that's, that's very clear. Yep. So there are uses, like you had mentioned there, and there's uses for uh, all three of them. Some are going to be more effective in other applications than others. Right. And I think it's important to remember, too, that varnish is nothing new. I mean, it's become um, very popular with the, the uh, implementation of Group 2 and more highly refined base stock oils, especially used in turbine lubrication. But, you know, we see varnish in... Um, Gosh, water-based fluids, um, alternative synthetics that you can't treat with ICB and whether VTM media, you know, we've been able to address those fluids. Things like uh, steel mill hydraulics, uh, injection molding machine hydraulics, and even some lubricating applications like dragline, where, um, you know, it might not meet the technical modern definition of varnish, but you might call it sludge. You might call it something else. Um, you might spit on the ground and say a four-letter word when you talk about it. But, you know, we've also been successful at um, restoring those applications, too. And that could be some uh, combination of the things you mentioned, like it could be something to do with water. could be fine particles. could be a change from hot to cold. Um, and something precipitates out. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And in those cases, it might not be as easy to quantify, hey, am I going to have a risk of varnishing or not with a, an MPC test or something. And some of those, in some of those applications, it's, just, it's as much about, wow, my servo valves aren't sticking anymore. My proportional valves aren't sticking anymore where they were. And when I open that system up and inspect it, it looks clean. Uh, you can see that on gears and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the bearings that are um, inside those gears as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Uh, you mentioned non-spark discharge and sparking. Uh, the, just to kind of circle back and talk about that, high flow areas, that's where we see the sparking occurring more often. It's not always everywhere, but also very dry oils as well. Dry fluids, high flow rates with, with a high degree of shear, uh, group two lubricants and above, uh, do not do not shed an electric charge. They actually gain static electricity, and when they gain that static electricity, eventually the the, the charge will get high enough that it seeks ground. And you know, there's there's videos you can go online, and uh, I think you can go to YouTube and and do a search on lightning in a hydraulic system or lightning in a filter element. There's several ways to get some of these videos up. And it literally looks like a lightning storm going on in a, in, a, in a lubrication reservoir because of static discharge within the fluid. Every one of those events, uh, temperatures are estimated to be up around 1,000 degrees C. So if lubricants begin to break down at a faster rate, uh, once you get above 150 degrees Fahrenheit, imagine what we're doing when we're at 1,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, a lot of damage. Yeah, you know, we, we, when we were developing our N NSD media years ago for, for one of the national uh, nationwide power generators, one of, the, one of the benefits that we were not expecting, it wasn't even part of the design process. We, we were trying to design a very efficient filter element to mechanically remove particles, which was what that particular filter element was there to do. 
and to do it in a way that, that, that we dissipated these electrostatic charges as opposed to allow, allowing them to increase and, and seek ground. But after nine months of testing on, on the first turbine where we installed this media, we noticed that the MPC dropped from a, from a value of 28, delta E of 28, to a delta E of 7. And when the elements were removed, there was visible varnish on the elements themselves. Uh, it, that wasn't part of our design process. We weren't, we weren't even focused on that. We were trying to solve this one problem and still provide high efficient filtration. We then took that phenomenon, so to speak, and, and said, well, was this just one weird installation or is this something that can be moved across that industry? And as a rule, everywhere that, that, that I've been involved in, with the installation of NSD media, not only did that pinging, clacking, static, popping sound go away inside, inside Louisville housings, MPC values drop as well. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And that was an unintended consequence of that design. But, you know, the glass media and certain materials function like an insulator in that system where you get the high flow. Um, and if the, the static that is accumulating um, on that element has nowhere to go or can't dissipate easily, it's going to build. Right. Um, so I think what we found in that instance was we had the right balance of materials um, so that we were not electrifying the fluid, but that filter element did have, I think, some small um, attraction to it, and it was also removing uh, the varnish. I, I often wonder if it was, was it actually working as an electrostatic filtration system, removing insolubles? I, I don't know if that's the case or not. That's, I think I'm not a PhD of, of chemistry, but all I know is you put that filter element in, the popping zone goes away, oil cleanliness improves, and MPCs decrease. Yep. All of and those that, are good things. And that's one of the important parts about the, the NSD element is, you know, you're eliminating one of the sources of varnish. You know you're going to have oxidation in fluids when you have high temperatures and other things going on, and, and oil just oxidizes naturally anyway. But if you can avoid those thermal events from sparking, you're doing yourself a favor, and you're doing your oil a favor. Correct. This has been the Hypro Podcast. For more information on any of our products or services, you can find us on the web at www.hyprofiltration.com. Remember, please lubricate responsibly.